Okay, I'm going to get started with this next topic. So welcome back to all of you guys here at the temple and everyone online. Welcome back. This next topic is developing and maintaining relationships, choosing wholesome friends and a life partner. When you study the original teachings of the Buddha, he frequently mentions how important this is as part of your practice, that developing relationships around you and having wholesome friends and companions and comrades is what he says, that if you've ever been in relationships or in a group of people that were into unwholesome things, one of the things you might have noticed is that your mind tended to lean towards those unwholesome things. If you're choosing to be around people who are using drugs and intoxicants and substances that cause heedlessness or stealing or lying or using profanity, this is what your mind's going to tend to do when you're around that kind of environment. So the Buddha teaches that it's a real priority to ensure that you're selecting wholesome friends and companions and comrades in your life, that this is a significant portion of the path to enlightenment. Because by you having people who are into wholesome things, your mind's going to tend to lean in that direction too. But in order to do this, you need to learn how to do it without judgment, where you're not judging other people, you're not looking down on other people. If you're looking down on other people and judging other people, this is harming your own mind. So I'm going to teach you how to practice discernment, which is wise decision making. Rather than judging others and putting yourself above people and looking down on them. Instead, I'm going to teach you how to use discernment, which is wise decision making of who to include in your life without actually looking down on others. And just like everything else that as I share with you, you're welcome to ask any and all questions as we go. Okay, so just like many of these topics, I start off by saying you need to acquire wisdom, right? Because I never know who's going to be in one talk versus another because people are coming and going. And I like to start out each one of these kind of topics of just saying, hey, you're going to need to acquire wisdom. You're going to need to know the path to enlightenment in order to acquire wholesome friends in order to develop those relationships for friends and life partners. You're going to need to have the wisdom of the path to enlightenment because what the Buddha is teaching you is the natural law of gamma of cause and effect or action and result. And when you meet certain people, if you're seeing certain things, certain decisions that they're making that are leading to unwholesome results, your choice to be their friend or your choice to be their life partner is going to lead to unwholesome results for you. So it's not that your life partner stealing and lying and having substances that cause heedlessness. It's not that those things are directly affecting you. What's affecting you in that situation is your decision to be their life partner. Now, when they're stealing, when they're lying, when they're having substances that cause heedlessness and they're getting arrested and you have to pick them up at jail, you have to give them bail money, you're hiring lawyers for them. This is all due to your decision to be their life partner. So any decisions that you make to be friends or a life partner with anybody, that decision is going to impact you if that person is making unwise decisions. So you're going to need to acquire wisdom about the natural law of gamma of cause and effect so that as your friends and your life partner or or your potential life partner is making decisions that you're going to be able to see like, ah, that's going to lead to unwholesome results or, oh, that's going to lead to wholesome results. And then you can make wise decisions about who to include in your life. So this first part of what I'm going to be describing for you is related to friends and life partners, but then eventually towards the end, I'm going to get to just talking about life partners because there's some specific things to learn about there. So you're going to need to learn about the natural law of gamma. This is what's going to help you to determine whether or not it would be wise to associate with any particular person as a friend or to include someone in your life as a life partner. If you can understand the various fetters and the natural law of gamma and all the other aspects on the path to enlightenment, you'll be able to make wise decisions about who to include in your life. Who you choose to include in your life, it really matters that you can make wise decisions or you can make unwise decisions. There's been people in my life that I've chosen to include in my life at different points of times and I found out that they were lying to me about very significant things and I chose to move on from those relationships. But then there's relationships that I have now that the whole reason why we're in relationships is because this person was honest and truthful and those are the type of relationships that you would like to 
create in your life. The Buddha gives this analogy. He describes it as the snake that passes through feces. This is a, a story or a simile that he shares where it helps you to illustrate what it is that he's talking about and why it's so important to have wholesome friends and a life partner. He talks about this snake that passes through feces. What feces is, is like poop, right? Defecation, right? Excrement. And that this snake passes through feces and that as this snake passes through the feces, it rubs up against you and it smears this feces on you. So in a situation where you have a friend who's into unwholesome things, the Buddha is describing it as the snake who passes through feces and now it smears this feces on you. That the snake might not bite you, but it's going to smear feces on you. And here's a here's an actual real life story to be able to help you on, illustrate this and understand what it, what he's talking about. Like say when you were 10 years old, you had a really close friend of yours that was a really good friend and you guys have always been friends since you're 10 years old and you've just been in this relationship uh, all throughout this time since you were 10 years old. But as you guys aged, maybe by the time this person was 16, 18, 20, maybe they started selling uh, substances that cause heedlessness, like maybe cocaine or heroin or crystal meth or something like this. And you've always known this about them and you guys are close friends. They've never offered you these drugs and they know that you don't use these drugs, but but nonetheless, they're choosing this as a livelihood. Well, if you understand the natural law of karma, you know that it's very unwise to stand on the street corner and sell substances that cause heedlessness or base your livelihood in anything related to substances that cause heedlessness. But nonetheless, because of your attachment, maybe, or because of your clinging, you're holding on to this relationship very tightly. Well, now when you guys are in the car together and they've got drugs on them and the police pull you over, maybe they slip the drugs under your seat. And now the police search the car and they search the car and they find the drugs under your seat. Even though you've never even maybe seen crystal meth or you've never even seen heroin before. Now with these drugs under your chair, the police search your car, you're the one that's going to jail. This is what the Buddha is describing, that the snake is smearing you with feces. Or say you're walking down the street with this friend and maybe a rival drug dealer sees you walking together with this person, sees this person, and maybe this rival drug dealer pulls out a gun and starts trying to shoot your friend and kill your friend as a rival drug dealer. Well, now you're being smeared because you could potentially get one of these bullets. So it's not that you're selling drugs, you're not the one that's doing that, but it's your decision to associate with this type of person that's causing you difficulties and struggles in your life. That's the karma, that's the natural law of karma, that you're choosing to associate with someone who's into unwholesome things and now this snake can smear you. And the Buddha's helping you to understand that in order for you to get to a life of where you're peaceful and joyful, your mind's peaceful and joyful, you're not being impacted by unwise decisions that are producing unwholesome results, you're gonna need to cultivate relationships with wholesome people without judging them. So in this situation, if I had this friend I wouldn't judge them and look down on them because they're choosing to sell heroin or crystal meth or whatever. That's their choice. That's a choice that they're making. I'm not looking down on them as a lesser of a person or a bad person or anything like that, but that's their decision. And then as a wise decision for myself, I would just choose not to associate with that individual because it would be unwise for me to walk down the street with a active drug dealer who could potentially get bullets coming their way or they have actual drugs on them and they could slip it under my chair. It would cause me difficulties from making those decisions. So that's what the Buddha is describing about the snake that can smear you with feces. One of the things that you might use as a way to guide you in making wise decisions about who to include in your life as either a friend or a life partner is the five precepts. That if you've learned the five precepts using the words of the Buddha, where he teaches about killing and stealing, sexual misconduct, lying and intoxicants, but learning that with the original words of the Buddha as I've shared them in the book and in the classes and things like that, you can learn the ins and outs of the five precepts and you can use those as a baseline understanding as wisdom that you have on board that you know if you do any of those things it's going to produce unwholesome results in your life if you're killing stealing having sexual misconduct if you're lying or taking substances that cause heedlessness it's going to produce unwholesome results for you so then if you chose to be in a relationship with friends or a life partner who were doing any of those things it's going to cause difficulties in their life. So now by you choosing to be a friend with that person or having a life partner that's doing those types of things, 
it's going to cause you difficulties in that situation because of your choice to be friends with them or to, to be in a life partner relationship with them. So you can use the five precepts as a guide in terms of wisdom. Again, not judging other people, not looking down on them, but using it as discernment of what it would be wise for you to be in a particular relationship. Would it be wise to associate with someone who's killing or stealing or having sexual misconduct or lying or taking substances that cause heedlessness because these decisions that they're making are going to impact you because of your decision to be their friend or life partner. So you can use that as a baseline uh, foundation for you to make decisions around your relationships. When you think about wholesome friends, I would encourage you to think about wise friends. You're looking for people who are making wise decisions about their life. Because as you associate with people who are wise, this is going to help you to cultivate wisdom as well. Again, not in a judgmental way, but just understand wholesome means wise, that they're making wise decisions. Um, if a friend or a life partner understands and practices non-clinging and non-attachment, this will be really helpful. If you're noticing that you have friends that are constantly bombarding you with messages or phone calls and they're having expectations that you should reply to them in a certain period of time, or they get angry when you change your plans, maybe you're saying, hey, I'm going to come visit you on Friday. It'd be great to see you on Friday. Well, then on Thursday, if you call them and say, hey, I can't come, if they get really angry and hostile and bitter with you, this is because of their attachment. And you can be able to see that, that they're causing their own their discontentedness and they're going to associate that with you. So you would like to associate with friends and life partner that understands non-attachment. And while they may be attached to you to a certain level, that they have control over their mind, that they understand that any kind of discontentedness that they're experiencing is being caused by their own mind. So that then, they're not blaming you for the feelings that they're experiencing because in a relationship where someone doesn't understand craving and clinging, they're going to be blaming you for their emotions and their feelings. And this is not going to be very enjoyable for you to be in a relationship where people are constantly blaming you for their feelings. And then when they have those painful feelings, they might push you aside in the relationship. So this is where you would like to be sure that your friends and the people that you associate with, definitely a life partner, understands not non-craving and non-clinging and non-attachment because that's going to promote the most healthy relationships in your life. Um, it's important to not allow others to cling to you where you see people clinging to you because not everybody in your life is going to know these teachings where you see them clinging to you. You can skillfully do things to ensure that they don't cling to you, right? So say you have a friend that calls you on the phone and then you don't answer it. And then you notice they call you again two minutes later and then you don't answer it for one reason or another. And then they call you again two minutes later. You can see, oh my goodness, this person's craving. They're clinging. They're really wanting to get a hold of you. Well, in these kinds of situations where you see this, it would be wise for you to not answer the phone. Right. So you can actually skillfully do things to help them eliminate their craving. So now three hours later, six hours later, even a day or two later, you can call them back and say, hey, how's it going, friend? What's up? And they're like, oh, what's going on? I was trying to get a hold of you yesterday. I was so worried about you. I knew you were going, uh, you know, snowboarding and I was so worried about whether you're going to be OK or not. Well, right there, you know, they're attached to you, right? They're not a bad person. They haven't done anything wrong. It's just that their mind is holding on to you and you would like to do things skillfully that help them to let this go. And that means that when they're text texting you or calling you by phone, that you don't just immediately answer it right away. In some cases you might, but in other cases, put some time and some space into this. And if you do this early in your relationships, it's actually best. Whereas if you start a relationship or you have relationships now where people are grabbing at your time and tugging and pulling, it'll be more challenging for you to gradually let go. Whereas if you meet a new friend and you notice that they're craving and clinging and they're grabbing at your time, it's best to introduce some impermanence early on in the relationship and put some space in between the time where you reply to text messages, emails, 
uh, you know, phone calls and things like this. So they don't get used to you always being there and always picking up the phone and always sending them back a text message because one month, two months, three months down the road, there's going to be a period of time where they message you and you can't message them back right away. And they're going to get angry and they're going to get really frustrated and they're going to push you aside and they might vent that anger and hostility towards you. So if you early on in your relationship, put some space between your communication, this will help you and help that person to skillfully practice non-attachment and non-clinging. As you have friends and you have a life partner, if they understand true love, the topic that I talked about yesterday, this will really help you and it help them as well. Um, sometimes one of the best ways to do this is just say, hey, I've got this link to a video uh, of this teacher that was teaching about true love. I'm interested in getting your thoughts on this. Can you watch this video and let me know what you think? Right. This is just a skillful way to say, hey, you know, go go watch this video. <laughs> you know, So sometimes asking someone's opinion about a particular topic, they'll be willing to take the link and then uh, learn potentially of what's being taught there. And this can be really helpful uh, in your relationships. A healthy relationship is going to have politeness, kindness, friendliness and respect. If you expect people to be polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, you'll be discontent when they're not. But if you just understand that in order for a relationship to be healthy, there needs to be politeness, kindness, friendliness, and respect, and you need that in a relationship, and that's what you would like to practice yourself, and that's what you would like to see other people practicing, then when people are occasionally impolite, unkind, unfriendly, disrespectful, you won't be upset. You won't be angry. You won't be frustrated. Understand that this person is struggling in life. They're unenlightened. It's only an enlightened being that's going to be able to be polite, kind, friendly, and respectful in every single situation. Only an enlightened being. And you probably don't have too many friends that are enlightened or know too many people that are enlightened. So you're going to have occasional people in your life that are impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful. But if that's happening regularly, if it's happening frequently, if it's happening very intensely, where they're you know, very hostile and bitter, that's where you need to examine your decisions of whether or not it would be wise to move on from that relationship or whether or not this is just an occasional thing. You can understand it. It's just impermanence. They're working on it. And you can just understand that, okay, this person's challenged with being polite, kind, friendly, respectful. But in order for a relationship to be successful, it's going to need to have politeness, kindness, friendliness, and respect. And if you're practicing that, then the other person is more likely to practice that too. The more that you're polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, the people around you will be that way as well because that's what you're putting out. So that's what will come back to you. So you can look for this in your relationships. This is what's going to help you to practice and experience uh, results in your life where people are polite, kind, friendly, and respectful. The Buddha has this teaching where he talks about when you're developing relationships, that one of the ways to conduct a healthy relationship is that it should have these qualities, giving, enduring speech, beneficent conduct or moral conduct, and equality. He talks about this related to life partners. Sometimes people think that the Buddha degraded women or talked down about women. This isn't actually true. You'll hear this from time to time that people themselves might feel like women are less of a person and they might be trying to think that the Buddha taught those kinds of things. But I have never seen anywhere in the teachings of the Buddha where he degraded anybody, not a man, not a woman, not a person who prefers same gender relationships, anybody. And enlightened bringing is not going to be degrading or disparaging towards anybody. So he actually teaches that when you have a partnership with a life partner, that the way to ensure that that relationship is successful is to have giving, meaning you practice generosity amongst yourselves, that you have endearing speech, that you have beneficent conduct or moral conduct, and you treat each other equally. And in this situation, he was actually talking to a man, and this man had a wife, and he was teaching this man to treat his wife equally as an equal. So wherever you see people that are saying that the Buddha taught that women are less of a person or anything like this, this isn't actually true. You will never see anywhere in the words of the Buddha where he did that kind of thing. He taught people that everybody was equal. And this is the natural law of karma, what's going to promote healthy relationships in your life. So with your life partner, if you practice giving and generosity, 
toxicity in your friends and your family members, this will be really helpful. And of course, enduring speech. Uh, where you're using the five factors of well-spoken speech and you have good wholesome moral conduct around right speech and right action and you practice equality thinking that everybody's equal whereas if you think people are above you or below you this is not going to promote the most healthy relationships so you can do little things like me and my wife we practice generosity with each other sometimes i'm out at a market and you know i know she likes avocados and avocados are kind of rare in thailand you don't see them very often so if I see an avocado when I'm out, I will buy her a couple avocados and bring them home, right? And then she knows that I like brownies. So when she sees brownies, she will purchase some brownies and bring those home every once in a while. Um, it's not something I expect of her or she expects of me. But every once in a while, we practice a little generosity with each other like this. So this will help you to promote healthy relationships with each other and all these other qualities that the Buddha talks about as well. It's helpful to eliminate confrontation in your relationships. Uh, we were talking a little bit about that earlier, about you don't have to confront a relationship. Sometimes we feel like we have to be confrontational in our relationships. This is just going to promote hostility. If you understand that disagreement is normal, that people are going to disagree with you and you're going to disagree with them, and that doesn't mean that we have to fight to the bitter end to figure out who's right and who's wrong, because there's multiple right answers. Right? To any one particular issue, there's multiple right answers. Sometimes when the ego is involved, we think that there's one right answer and there's all the rest are wrong. This is why I don't think about things as right and wrong. I think about things as wise and unwise. There's multiple wise answers in any given situation. And there's multiple unwise answers in any given situation. So oftentimes when we have disagreements and relationships and there's craving desire attachment for everyone to permanently agree with you you might feel like you have to confront this person right so you're going to be in conversations where people say things that you disagree with and that doesn't mean you need to step in and teach them the right way because there's multiple right ways there's multiple wise ways there's not just one way to think about any particular thing so if every time you hear something you disagree with you feel like you need to be in an argument or confrontation or you need to convince them to agree with you you're going to spend a lot of time trying to convince people to agree with you and that is your ego that's doing that that's the craving desire attachment everyone needs to agree with me this isn't true you can be in a conversation where somebody says something you disagree with and you just stay quiet that's okay right that's an acceptable thing you don't have to tell people what you feel what you think what your opinions are uh, sometimes we're very opinionated in the unenlightened state and we feel like everybody needs to know our opinion because we're right and everybody else is wrong but that's just the ego so you can set this aside which will help you to eliminate confrontation in your relationships where you can have discussions or you need to have discussions have discussions that can be helpful but don't feel like you're required to that everyone doesn't need to agree with you and not everybody will agree with you because of impermanence um, <clears throat> don't assume that you know the full story when you're in relationships sometimes when we experience certain interaction in our relationships we think that we know the full story we have assumptions the buddha refers to this as perceptions and he teaches that if you cling to your perceptions then it will cause discontentedness what a perception is is your views and opinions about the world and they may or may not be true so you're not going to always know the full story of any given situation and you're going to need to ask questions in order to find out the full story there are situations where i hear things about my son of things that he's done at school or people come and talk to me about certain things with my son and if i just assume that those things were true then i would be leading I would be going down a path of making decisions based in false information. So whenever somebody tells me something about my son, like a teacher or something like this, the first thing I will do is I will go to my son and I will say, can you help me understand what happened at school today? And now I will get his side and I will get the teacher's side and I will get this other student's side and I will listen to all sides and I will figure out what potentially occurred here, right? So if we assume that we know the full story, we'll be making unwise decisions because we're making decisions based on false information. So it's really helpful to ask questions and get clarity on any particular topics related to your friendships or your life partner or things like this. Then 
it's helpful to be a problem solver that in your relationships, you guys are going to have problems, whether it's friends or whether it's a life partner, there's going to be problems. I don't think of things as problems anymore. I think of them as challenges. There's going to be some challenge that occurs and you're going to need to figure out how to solve that challenge. So my wife shared with me this weekend that she's going to go to Bangkok on May 10th and she's going to come back on May 12th. And that was the first time I had heard of it. She asked me to help her book tickets. And I was like, okay, I'll help you book tickets. Then when I looked at my schedule, I realized that I'm going to be teaching classes on that particular Friday. And usually my wife would pick up my son on that Friday, but she's going to be gone. So I needed to talk to her about what was happening. And then I realized like, okay, I'm going to need to figure out a different solution here, right? Because she's not always going to be available to pick up my son the way that we normally do. <clears throat> so you guys are going to meet certain challenges because of impermanence. Things are going to be changing. But if you become a very good problem solver, any kind of challenges that you meet with, with your friends or your life partner, you'll be able to solve it. Because by the time you get to enlightenment, you'll be a very good problem solver because you've solved the biggest problem that you've ever encountered in your life. The biggest problem that you've ever encountered is your mind is discontent. You have craving, desire, attachment. You're stuck in the cycle of rebirth. And by the time you get to enlightenment, you will have figured out through the teachings of the Buddha, all the wisdom that you need in order to escape that discontentedness, to eliminate that discontentedness and escape the cycle of rebirth. That's the biggest problem that you've ever encountered in this particular life or any previous lives. So by the time you get to enlightenment, you will have solved the most major problem you've ever experienced, which is discontentedness. And you're going to need to solve a whole lot of other little challenges along the way. So you'll be a very good problem solver by the time you get to enlightenment. And you're going to need to practice that in all your relationships because you'll have different challenges where one person wants to do one thing and another person is interested in doing something else or there's some conflict at home you're going to need to come together and solve that so get really good at discussing things having conversations solving problems together this is a great skill to have even as you're developing a life partner, a potential life partner early on in your relationship, learning how to solve challenges together can be really helpful. Um, take your time because as we oftentimes are interested to make friends or we're interested to have a life partner, oftentimes there's a lot of hurry, hurry, hurry. Sometimes people base their inner feelings on how many friends that we have, right? Nowadays we have social media that tells you how many friends you have on social media, right? You have 100 or 300 or 2,000. And sometimes people have a craving, desire, attachment to have all these friends and all these people in your life wanting, thinking that if I have 200 friends, I'm not as good as someone who has 500 friends on Facebook. Well, if you determine your self-worth based on the number of friends that you have on social media, this is very unwise, right? So take your time. Don't feel like you need to be in a rush to hurry up and make friends with people. And don't feel like you have to be in a rush to get a life partner if that's what you're choosing to do. Again, not everyone's going to have a life partner, but if you have a life partner, take your time. This is the most impactful decision you're ever going to make in your life. Who you choose to be a life partner is a monumental decision. It's going to impact you in multiple ways in your life. And if you make a wise decision, it will produce wholesome results for you. And if you make an unwise decision, it will produce unwholesome results in your life. So sometimes we're in a hurry to hurry up and get a life partner, to hurry up and get children, to hurry up and do this, to hurry up and do that. What are you hurrying up for? You're just hurrying up to die. That's all we're headed for. <clears throat> Every single one of us are headed towards death. And if you're hurrying, all you're doing is hurrying towards death right? So just take your time and be patient and realize that wise decision making oftentimes comes through taking your time. A rushed and hurried decision isn't a well thought out decision. If you hurry up and make a decision about something, you're going to tend to make unwise decisions in those situations. But where you can take your time and you can thoroughly think out a decision, this is going to lead to wise decision making. Okay, so take your time in your decisions. As you're meeting with friends and you're meeting potential life partners, look at how they treat other people because how they treat other people is how they're going to treat you. Early in a relationship, usually everyone's on their best behavior. You're in a honeymoon stage. The first month, the first two months, the first three months, 
everybody's on their best behavior. But the way that they treat other people is going to be an indication for you of how they're going to treat you. So if they're treating their mom or their dad or their brothers and their sisters in a certain way, or they're treating food servers, taxi drivers, people at a hotel, if they're treating them aggressive and hostile and bitter, if they're disparaging them and they're talking in degrading ways about other people, it's only a matter of time before that honeymoon phase is over between you and them. And they're going to be talking about you in the exact same way. So if you look at how people treat others, this is an indication of how they're going to treat you at some particular point. So don't be mistaken by that honeymoon phase and think that, yeah, they're treating you so great because that honeymoon phase is going to be over after a month or two or three, and they're going to be treating you the same way that they treat everybody else. So use that as an indication for you where you're not judging them. You're not looking down on them for the way that they treat others, but you're just using discernment or wise decision-making about looking at how they treat others. And this is how they're going to treat you at some point. Understand that your role in life is not to please others through your relationship choices. Sometimes we think that we have to find the partner that our parents want, or we, or we need to find a partner that our brothers or sisters want, right? If I would have chose the partner that my parents and my sister wanted, I probably would have been single my entire life because every partner that I ever had, I think my family didn't like them, right? Every time I would have some girlfriend that I would come home, they immediately didn't like her, right? So when I finally found the wife that I currently have, my family didn't like her initially, but within a short period of time, my mom really warmed up to her and said, wow, this is the best person you've ever you know, met. And eventually my sister the same way. But initially, if I would have listened to them and I tried to please them through my relationship choices, I would have never been with my current wife, which was one of the best decisions that I ever made was to be with her, right? So your goal isn't to please others through your relationship choices. Everyone else is living their life. Mom, dad, brothers, sisters, they've made their choices about who they would like to involve in their life. This is your life. You get to make your decisions in your life and your decisions aren't going to always please other people. But if you eliminate any expectation that your decisions will please other people, you can realize that this is your decision. It's your life, your decisions and your results. And your goal isn't to please other people through your relationship choices. So choose the people that you think are best for your life. And that's what's going to help you develop the type of life that you would like to develop rather than just trying to please mom or dad through your decisions about who to be with. And then leave space for growth in terms of your friends and your life partners. I kind of shared a little bit about this with you guys yesterday when we were talking about true love, that when you get together with a partner or friends, you guys are going to change. It's not going to be the same relationship, right? When me and my wife first got together, I was a business owner. I had lots of money, I had lots of assets, lots of investments. She wasn't working. She was cooking, cleaning, doing all kinds of things, uh, doing laundry. Uh, those things all changed. I'm not a business owner anymore. I don't have lots of money. Uh, she's no longer doing uh, the cooking, cleaning, and laundry, right? I'm doing those kinds of things for myself now, right? So if I was clinging to these kinds of things, thinking that that was her love, the cooking, cleaning, and laundry, then when she was no longer able to do those things anymore, I would feel like the love is gone, right? But the love isn't the cooking, cleaning, laundry. Those are just activities that we're doing because we have love for each other. But you can still love somebody without doing those things. The money that I was able to afford to help her in the past, yes, I was providing that because I loved her, but that isn't the love itself. So now that I don't provide her any money anymore, I still love her and she can feel that love. But if she thought that the love was the money, when the money was gone, she would have felt like I don't love her anymore. But she's able to see like, hey, he still loves me. He just doesn't have the money that he used to have. So she goes out and makes her own money now, right? She doesn't look to me for any kind of money. So people are going to change and people are going to grow and people are going to evolve and become different people. And you need to leave space for that in your relationships. Otherwise, if you cling to this person being exactly the same all the time, then you'll be discontent as they change. Whether it's their appearance, their hobbies, their activities, or things that they're into, as those things are all changing, you need to be understanding that this is just impermanence. One time I had a student of Thai massage when I was in America, and I didn't talk to that person for one reason or another for like five or six years, and they contacted me and they said, David, I've heard that you've changed so much since I first studied Thai massage with you. It's like, yeah, of course. 
right? We all change, right? That's impermanence. Uh, but this person's mind was craving permanence and wanting me to be exactly the same way I was when they first met me. And now that I've changed, they couldn't be a friend anymore. They couldn't be a student anymore because they felt like I had changed, right? So if every time somebody changes, we decide we can't be friends with them anymore, then you're not going to be friends with very many people because people are constantly changing. So you're going to need to leave space for growth in your relationships, either as a life partner or as a friend. Okay. So any questions here, this is about friends and life partners. The things that I have to share with you next are just about life partners. Anything here or anything online, you can put it into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. All right, so now we'll talk about life partners. If you're not interested in having a life partner, you can just tune this out, right? Or maybe you listen, and then this is advice that you can give your friends who are interested in having a life partner. If you're looking to get a life partner, this is going to be very crucial for you. If you currently have a life partner and things aren't going well in your relationship, there might be some things here that will help you to be able to bring that relationship more into harmony, okay? So the first thing to understand in terms of life partner is the perfect partner doesn't exist. You're never going to find the perfect partner. Sometimes we have this image in our mind of exactly the type of partner that we want to be with, and we go out into the world and try to find that person. That person only exists within your own mind. They don't exist in real life. And even if they did exist, as soon as you started finding that particular partner, they're going to change. And your expectations are going to change too. So you need to set aside the idea of like the perfect partner or Prince Charming or Princess Charming. They don't exist. It only exists within your own mind. Okay. Next is as you're developing a relationship with a potential life partner, it would be helpful to develop important skills that you guys are going to need in your relationships together. Oftentimes when we're in the dating process, we make a date where we come together we go to the movies, we go to dinner or what have you, and then we come back and we go our separate ways. We come together, we go to a museum, we go to the park, we go do something and then we go away, right? We're always doing some type of activity together. This is the dating process. But by the time you guys live together or you're married or you're having kids, you're not going to necessarily be doing those kinds of things. You're going to just be sitting around the house and you know, they're going to be in one room and you're going to be in another room. And, you know, there's not going to be the dating kind of thing going on anymore. And you guys are going to be living life with each other. So during the dating process, if you guys can get used to doing those kinds of things where maybe they're in one room reading a book and you're in another room watching TV, right? Or maybe you're in one room meditating and they're in another room watching TV, right? These are helpful things where oftentimes in the dating process, we're always doing things together we're not necessarily doing things separately. So in the dating process, if you're together, but yet doing things separately, this will actually help you to develop non-attachment in your relationships. This whole dating process that we call dating in the Western world, here in Thailand, they refer to it as learning each other. I think this is really helpful to keep in mind that what you're really doing when you're coming together with a potential life partner is you're learning each other. You're learning about them and they're learning about you. And what you're trying to learn is, can I get along with this person? Is this person the type of person that I would be interested in spending time with? Is this the type of person that's not going to be blaming me and being upset with me and having ego and arrogance and being bitter and harsh and hostile? You know, you're learning this person. And over three months, six month period, you're learning this person and they're learning you. And you're trying to make a decision. Is this somebody that I could be with long term, right? Through this learning process, because the honeymoon phase is going to fade away. And you would like to know, is this a person that I'm committed to? Do I see enough qualities in this person that they're interested in inner growth and inner development? Are they patient? Are they calm? And they may not be some of those things, right? And they may need to work on those things. But as long as they know that they have those things to work on and they're willing to learn and grow and develop, this is somebody that you could potentially be successful with. But if they're not interested in learning, if they're not interested in growing, if they're not interested in becoming a better person and they think they're already perfect the way that they are, 
this is going to be problematic for you guys because they're unenlightened, you're unenlightened, and if they're not willing to do inner work and growth and development, then you're not going to be able to grow together as a couple. So when you're developing a, a partnership and a potential life partner, you would like to learn each other and develop these important skills where you can sometimes be doing different things with each other, where maybe you guys come together, you come to your house, maybe you go out with your mom, they go out with your dad or something like this, or they go out with your sisters and brothers and some Something like this where you guys are together but yet you're apart and then you're uh, able to learn to do those kinds of things with each other or say you go to like a family picnic or something like this maybe you're off talking with your aunts and uncles and they're off talking with your mom and dad and this is okay you don't need to be attached at the hip in these social situations where you guys are together every single moment you guys can be away from each other but you're at the same event together this is actually very helpful for your mind to be able to do this Understand that official marriage isn't required in order to have a successful relationship. Sometimes we feel like, you know, putting a ring on your finger and getting that certificate from the government and doing a formal ceremony, that's the end all be all. We have that craving for that to occur. But that doesn't need to occur in order to have a successful relationship. Getting legally married in some cultures is actually beneficial for like financial reasons and tax reasons and if somebody were to die or if there's kids involved or something like that, it can be beneficial to have an official marriage. But essentially what you're doing with an official marriage is you're going to the government and you're reporting to the government that I'm going to be with this person now for a period of time and we're officially married. You can do that if you like, and there might be certain tax benefits and financial benefits to doing that, but you don't have to do that in order to be in a successful relationship with each other. My ex-wife, as soon as we got married, I felt very controlled and very constrained as soon as we had that official marriage. When I got out of that marriage, I felt more free. My current wife, we were together for about three years before we were officially married. I felt very free. Then when we officially got married, we started having all kinds of issues in our relationship. I became complacent in our relationship. I was like, yeah, we're married now. I don't have to do all those things, right? And what I noticed is our relationship deteriorated a bit. So we ultimately got to the point in 2015 uh, that we actually signed papers to legally divorce. So ever since uh, 2015, me and my current wife, we've been legally divorced, but we've continued to live together and have this relationship together. And our relationship improved from that point forward because now I know and she knows that anytime we would like to pick up our stuff and walk away, we can, that we're not legally obligated to go through a divorce and all that kind of stuff anymore, that we've let all that go. Here in Thailand, about 80% of the couples that you see, they're not legally married. Only about 20% of the couples are legally married here in Thailand. Um, they don't need to go down to the government and report who they're actually married to. And this can actually promote more health in your relationships in some situations because you know and they know that it's very easy to walk away. And in those situations, you'll be more diligent and more dedicated in a relationship. You won't let complacency come into the relationship like I did in our relationship. So whether you choose to get officially married or not, it's your choice. There can be advantages to that. But if you aren't interested in getting legal married you don't have to do that you can actually have a ceremony and have a have an event with your friends and family even without the legal marriage part of it if that's what you would like to do so sometimes as little girls and little boys we have this idea in our mind of this perfect wedding and we want to have a particular wedding but you don't have to report to the government who you're going to be with you can have a ceremony you can have an event you can have a long-term sustaining relationship with an official document from the government or without one. And sometimes when you have that official document, it can promote some complacency in the relationship. So you can keep your eye on this and take a look at what's best for you and your partner. There's no such thing as getting married and then living happily ever after. This actually doesn't work. It's only in fairy tale books that you see this. In reality, you're not getting married and living happily ever after. What happens instead is you meet each other, you learn each other, you work on developing skills and abilities to solve challenges with each other, you learn to communicate, you learn to have discussions, you learn to be friends, you learn to not want anything from each other, you learn to be interested in seeing your partner be well and succeed, 
you support, encourage, and motivate each other to accomplish whatever they'd like to accomplish without putting expectations or controlling conduct into the relationship. And then by doing all those things, you will live happily ever after, <clears throat> right? So it's not meet, get married, and live happily ever after. <clears throat> There's a whole lot of work in the relationship that if you do that stuff before marriage, it will actually be really helpful for you. But even in getting married, you're going to need to learn how to do these types of things with each other. This is what is really involved in having a successful relationship. So if you get rid of that live happily ever after thing that we see in fairy tales frequently and realize that there's real work in relationships to do all of these things, you'll be a lot more successful. Learning to spend time doing different activities, like I was mentioning that you're together, but yet you're doing different activities. This is really helpful. Understand that changes will occur in terms of your appearance of your life partner. That's going to change. Whereas if you meet very young in life and you're craving and clinging to this youthful appearance, as they age and as you age, you'll become discontent because if the mind's craving for this youthful appearance, as things start to change, you'll be discontent with that. And you might otherwise end a very successful relationship because you're wanting a younger person and you're craving that physical appearance of a younger person. So understand that your partner, whatever they look like when you get together, they're not going to look like that permanently, right? There's going to be impermanence because of the universal truth of impermanence. And all kinds of changes will occur in your relationships. So any questions on wholesome friends and life partners and how to do this without judgment? No? Okay. Let's see if we have anything online. All right. So this brings us to the end of today. We can just end class here. It's uh, 12 o'clock rather than taking a lunch and coming back. This is the topic uh, that I usually end with on Thursdays. Tomorrow, what we're going to do is meditation in the morning. And then we're going to move into a topic called the art of the friendly no, how to say no without saying no. This is going to really help you in your relationships because when you say no to an unenlightened being, like if they invite you to a party and you say, no, I can't come, they will oftentimes get painful feelings if they have craving, desire, attachment. And when they get those painful feelings, they're going to attribute it to you and potentially push you away. So what you'll find is if you learn how to say no without saying no in these situations, which I'll teach you tomorrow, you'll be a lot more successful in your relationships. And we typically will end class a little bit early tomorrow as well. Sometimes students like to go out to lunch together uh, on the last day of this particular class. If you guys would like to go out and do like a group lunch somewhere together, I can make some recommendations tomorrow. Uh, we'll see tomorrow what you guys feel like. Um, but tomorrow we usually do the meditation. We do the art of the friendly no. And then we finish class usually around 11, 1130. Sometimes students like to kind of clean up the temple a little bit. If you guys would like to do that, we can do those kinds of things. Um, and then I'll, I can propose places to go eat if you guys would like to have a nice lunch together. It's up to you guys. Um, but this is everything I have for today. And I'd just like to thank you guys for coming to learn the teachings of the Buddha. You guys can choose to meditate this afternoon or this evening on your own, of course, because you're going to need to integrate these teachings into your life. So as you choose to build up your life practice, meditation can be part of that. And as you guys need help, just feel free to reach out to me. I'm here to help you. Okay, so have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Sawadikap. Sawadikap.
thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you.